question. Uh, in the founding of this country, how many original colonies? 13. That was a gimme. And colonies, colonialism, imperialism, that might be important. <laughs> Let's come back to that, Orlando. But of those 13 colonies, here's a question. How many of those original colonies were actually corporations? Yeah, Scott! Scott! Show it up! Scott is in the house, y'all! Yeah. And you know what? Because Scott saw my trick question. He saw right through my trick question. Because I'll tell you something. The corporation was... did not, the, the, the king literally created those 13 colonies. The king created Massachusetts. Now, some of you might say, uh-uh. I mean, if that's what they, the king's not magic, Massachusetts was already there. Uh-uh. The land was there. The people who lived on the land was there. The, the, the deer, the forest, the fish, and the like, physical reality was there. But it took the king to create Massachusetts by a charter, a royal crown charter. The king literally created Massachusetts. And by the way, when the king created Massachusetts, the king did not create the state of Massachusetts. Do you know what the king actually created? Commonwealth. Not the Commonwealth, because this is a trick question. The king originally created the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. The king did not create the state of Virginia. The king created the Virginia Company. These were for-profit corporations. And now, in order to really illustrate that point, I'm going to uh, tell a story and uh, in this story, I'll be the king. And why might I be the king? Because I'm telling a story. I'm glad this, this is a good crowd. <laughs> Orlando, you got a good crew here. And now, you're in a good spot, Orlando, because before, you had, you had to be my slave. But now, I'm going to make you a governor. Oh, cool. Oh, what's this? Because, see, I'm the king, and I have sovereignty. And what does that mean? The authority to rule. I have ultimate power. So now, I am going to, with the stroke of a pen, create Massachusetts as a joint stock company. And I, but I'm not going to go about the business of the day-to-day -day affairs of actually governing it. That's beneath me. I've got other things to do. I've got other people to oppress and other things to steal. <laughs> so I will appoint Orlando as the royal governor of the joint stock company. And in the charter, and listen to these words, because it's actually in the original charter, creating Massachusetts, I will appoint Orlando and give him the responsibility and the authority to plant, to rule, and to govern this new joint stock company in my name for my benefit and for the benefit of the shareholders. Now, in this scenario, we might think of Orlando as something besides just a royal governor. What word what might we use? Say it louder, sister. A CEO. a CEO. So think about this. Another way to say it is when the American revolutionaries rise up against the royal governor and the king, it's not just a rejection of monarchy as a form of rule. It's also literally a people's uprising against CEOs and the unelected and unaccountable power of corporate CEOs. And so when... We, you know, I used to say the American revolutionaries were not merely calling for a more socially responsible king. You know? And so maybe today we could do something more than just ask for more socially responsible corporations. I mean, are any, is, am I the only one? Or maybe somebody else also feels like I'm, fe I'm a little sick and tired of feeling like I'm always begging these corporations. Oh, please, mighty corporations, would you please not spew quite so much poison into the air in the surrounding community because you're literally killing children with asthma because of your actions? Oh, corporations, would you please not kill quite so many coal miners in West Virginia when you go about your business practices? Oh, mighty corporation, would you please not destroy the entire freaking Gulf of Mexico ecosystem? You know, I mean, can't we raise our aspirations a little higher than that? Or is that really all we want? Is it a little less death? A little less oppression? A little less destruction? That's not what we want. So we ought to actually be willing to demand what we want, to articulate what we want. And here's something interesting, y'all. I said that the American revolutionaries were not asking for a more socially responsible king, but you know what? 
in the 1750s and the 1760s, those people who would become revolutionaries were in fact begging for a more socially responsible king. In fact, they were writing letters. These people who would become revolutionaries uh, about a decade before the Declaration of Independence were writing letters that went something like this. Oh, dear Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee because your royal governor are passing unfair laws. It's not just taxation without representation. There are unfair trade laws, unfair business laws that are not treating us fairly. The governor and the parliament of England, by the way, that owned what percentage of the English parliament do you think at this time owned shares in the East India Company? 100%. All. Oh, King, Parliament, your royal governor, they're passing unfair trade laws and unfair business policies that are preventing us from making a profit for ourselves and for the shareholders. So please, will you intervene on our behalf? It was the most sniveling, groveling language that you can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I'm keenly interested in trying to figure out just what exactly were those colonists, what kind of conversations were they having that allowed them to stop boot kissing? To actually stand up. And as King would say at a later time in American history, to find some steel for their backbone and stand up straight, put their shoulders back, put their chin up, and look directly at the king. And where did the king claim cultural authority? God, to challenge that whole cultural authority, look directly at the king and see behind the king the most powerful military the world had ever seen and said, you're done, get out. Yeah, yeah right? And the reason that I want to know how those people got to that point is because I will suggest to you going through that process is an exercise in self-respect. It is an exercise in coming to know what every other movement ultimately comes to know, and that is we can't depend on begging power. We have to understand what another great American said, Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. And the second part of that, people don't know as much, but I like it. He said, show me the exact amount of, an in, of injustice that a people are willing to tolerate, and I will show you exactly how much injustice will be visited upon them. Right? Today, I submit this, that we as a people are still on our knees. We are begging the ruling elite rather than actually making demands and actually daring to imagine that we can recreate our society and recreate culture. And so the American revolutionaries throw out the king and a new government gets put in its place and a new document gets put in its place to actually show how this society is going to operate, how the government is supposed to operate. And we are taught that there is a document, a literally a document that describes the government of the United States and how it operates. What's that document called? The U.S. Constitution. <laughs> and so very quickly, I'm going to lay out how the U.S. Constitution is supposed to operate. Now, I, how many people here have read the Constitution in the last year? Raise your hands. Oh, good. A good part of the crowd. I'm going to ask you this. Y'all grade my paper. See if I get this right. I will tell you that, broadly speaking, there are two principal actors in the Constitution. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's the beginning of that document. The first three words. We the people. We the people. And you know, all I have to do when I do this presentation is put my hand in my ear, and people will say it. Oftentimes, as you just did in unison, and that's because we the people are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. And we the people, under this framework, come together to create government. And in fact, to really put a fine point on it, we the people are described as being free and sovereign. And again, what does sovereign mean? Authority to rule. The authority to rule. We claim the authority to rule. Government does not have the authority to rule over we the people. In fact, government is not sovereign. Government is subordinate. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. The people. Government is accountable. Accountable to whom? People. The people. I like how that goes. It's got a ring to it, right? That kind of makes sense? I like this. We the people are free and sovereign because we're described as having 
rights. Government does not have rights. Government has duties. And in fact, this is very important to understand because if you have the right to do something, it means you can do it and you don't need anybody's permission. And if you have a duty, and if government has any duty, it means government has to do it, even if they don't want to. And this is very important, because another way to think about it, under this entire concept, all power actually resides here with the people. In fact, power to the people is not just a Black Panther Party chant, which it was. It was also an American Revolutionary chant. And I think that there's some magic to that chant. And to just try it out, I'm going to ask you to repeat this after me. Power to the people. Power to the people. Say it like you mean it. Power, Power to the people. people. How does that feel? Good. Good. Good, right? We don't say that very often in this country, do we? Do you know how the Black Panthers began every one of their meetings? Power, Power, to, Power the to the people. people. They would literally, and you know why? Because they believed it. Because even though they were living in an inherently racist system, they actually believed that they had the power and that they were going to actually recreate the society. And they went about the business of actually feeding children and putting shoes on their feet and providing self-defense, right? They meant it. Power to the people is a very powerful thing. And part of the reason that I get groups to do this is because I like to say it. Because it makes me feel good. And I want to ask you to start doing it yourself sometime. Practice it at home. Say it with some other people. If you actually start to say power to the people, if you start to actually feel it, all of a sudden, I promise you, yeah, yeah like that. Damn right. It's a different kind of thing. So here's the thing. 